Genre. In the world of Hollywood, movies get greenlit and redlit. They get remade and rebooted. But we are the ideal. I'm Sam Gash, and you are listening to Ideal Remake. Thank you for listening to Ideal Remake. We take movies that either have been, will be, or should be remade and talk about what the ideal version of that remake would be. Unfortunately, today I was running a bit late. I didn't want to keep you waiting, so I got engaged. Is that all right? Am I on time? And if so, Corsica is How to Steal a Million, a movie that has been, will be, or should be remade. Definitely should be. I think it's time. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about your experience with How to Steal a Million. Oh, it's been a favorite of mine since I was little, honestly. It's kind of just like, I don't know, I've always loved kind of action. Not necessarily, it's not an action movie, but like adventure movies. And this just in a way is like exhilarating as a kid to watch, like almost like a heist and yeah. um, just kind of doing it for, you know, her family and and just the the psychology of it. I always loved too, that it actually wasn't based on action or like this like huge plan it was just figuring it out as they went and using people against themselves in a way it was like and watching them figure it out as they went was so cool yeah yeah it's very very clever and i really enjoyed the whole thing yeah so i've i've watched it over and over as i've gotten older and i think you know like it is a classic you know and all of the actors are you know do make it very great but i think in some ways it's dated of course and so i think there's really fun ways that it could be remade and still hold up or even be better. That was one of the things I was thinking about as I was watching it for the first time uh, this week for this episode is <laughs> there are a lot of things that don't work and there are a lot of things that do still work. Like honestly, just the nature of the heist where mm-hmm. he just finds a toy on the street and uses that to like trip an alarm over and over and then just relies on just getting shut down by incompetence. And yeah. honestly... It kind of all still works. I know. That's what I was thinking. I was I was about to like research like what security systems are like <laughs> in place now for art and stuff. But yeah. I mean, it kind of like I I don't obviously it probably is way more complicated. I but imagine there's still, cameras now. Yeah, but it still is technology, mm-hmm. and we still do have a dependency on that technology. And so you know, I think the movie leaned into conveniences of like you know the president or whatever being like right next door and knowing him but of course you know um peter o'toole's character knew that so that was part of the plan but all of those things definitely could still you could still use you know there there were a couple things that didn't quite work in the heist aspect like when he has a a magnet through the wall and he's getting the key (laughs) and you see the key getting to like the frame of the wall, like the oh yeah, the when sconce. It, it jumps or whatever. Well, he's it's getting close to the sconce, close to the sconce, and they cut away, do something else, and yeah, when yeah. they cut back, it's already on the other side, <laughs> yeah. and you're like, oh, oh, it like has to turn the corner. Or yeah, something. yeah, they skip yeah, the yeah. corner. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, That's I would as yeah, that was probably smart. the right thing yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah, and then he like randomly like, oh, I just happen to have this tape here and this like, and like I kept like he's a professional thief so i kept expecting him to pick a lock and he never once picked a lock that's true i mean he did kind of pick the, that lock like he used that to like but it was it wasn't a pick it was the key yeah itself. he uh he he got the key the key didn't work and then he like finagled the key around to yeah. get the are we allowed to do spoilers oh yeah oh okay we're go- <laughs> we're going to kind of do a walkthrough of the whole movie okay cause... just because i assume there are people listening to this episode who haven't seen it uh they, that they have or they have That have not seen the movie. So we're going to tell them about the movie so that way we can talk about our okay. version. Okay. okay. So we're spoiling it. Spoil for everything. Okay, so it, go watch it if you, like, don't yeah. want it to be spoiled. But he's not actually a professional thief. Right, which was... So that's, the like, he's figuring it out for himself, too. And he did a great job. He doesn't job. know how to pick a lock, like, you know. When he, when he did, the, like, the magnetized string or whatever it was to the end of the key i was like that's really clever yeah, like that's so smart even as a writer i'm like damn like, yeah figuring that out is like i mean you get to kind of make it all fit how mm-hmm. you want but still extremely clever to just think of it in that way and yeah i mean honestly and exactly like it all worked the two things that didn't work for me is getting the key around the corner which yeah. is why they skipped around it oh, yeah. makes total sense yeah. And the fact that you could put Audrey Hepburn and just put a hat on her and people wouldn't still go, 
I what? know. Like, she's Audrey Hepburn. Yeah. She's going to be noticeable. I know. I also, I've always been a little annoyed that she continues cleaning in the end, like, when the chaos all erupts mm-hmm. and he's like, you know, it'll be chaotic. You go to the guards room because no one will be in the guards room. But of course, like, all no of the one other else is cleaning. cleaning. Yeah, because they're all like, whoa, what's happening? And she's just, like, scrubbing furiously. And it's like, no, like, that is suspicious. <laughs> like, why are you still cleaning? Like, I feel like you would not work if you didn't have to. She like... did this really interesting, like, competent incompetence the whole movie. Yeah. Like, she's Audrey Hepburn. She's a phenomenal actress. That but... is her quirk, kind of, though. Yeah. But you also notice, like, throughout the movie, like, there was... she. I kept noticing, like, oh, I want that thing. They're not letting me get that thing. But, like, her arm would kind of subconsciously go, to, like, to try to grab it, even though she couldn't. What do you mean? There was a moment when, uh, like, when they're first taking the statue away... Oh, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's just out she's of her gonna reach. And, her, it. Like, she and she's going to crush it. And she's going to crush it. They take that away. And yeah. then she, like, reaches for the stand. And then she tries to reach for the statue and it doesn't right, work. Right, right, right. Or, like, there's... And at the... Like, when he's... When, uh, uh, uh... Simon Dermott is showing her the different tools he's using. Like, her hands will kind of automatically go to the tool. And he's like, no, 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 let me do it. Mm, yeah. And it was just, like, a subtle character thing I noticed. And I don't have other examples in mind but it definitely happened at least three like once in each act huh yeah it was cool yeah definitely yeah to have to have that subtlety of Mm -hmm. her almost like but that's part of the datedness too of she's just like letting this guy kind of help her through it but i don't think it's really like because he's a man helping her it's because he's supposedly this professional right thief and she never she never felt incompetent yeah she was just kind of going along with yeah, she it, yeah. was relying on this guy who had the expertise she didn't have, mm-hmm. theoretically. Right, 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 right. It would still be terrifying, because for him, like, he was, he was, like, surprised that it was working as it was working, but to, like, yeah, like, the stakes obviously were so high to, like, <laughs> try it out in the actual doing of it is mm-hmm. terrifying. <laughs> yeah, and like, honestly... Like, if the boomerang just, like, hit the, <laughs> the right? statue... It's like, and he practiced once, and he practiced yeah, I know. Like, okay, over a it. ledge. He was like, <laughs> well, I'm clearly a boomerang master. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, like, there were... And there wasn't even that much... For older movies like this, like, this movie's from 1966, you kind of expect there to be more elements of just, like, kind of blatant era... era-appropriate misogyny. Yeah. And there wasn't as much as I was worried there would be. Definitely. I think the two worst cases were once she finally makes it to the guard room and Peter O'Toole just like kisses her and she's like screaming. She's like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. And he's like, no, it's me. And she was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Or at the very beginning when he kisses her after, when he puts her in the taxi. Yes. That one, that one kind of worked for me because she was like, it's a good thing you didn't try to kiss me goodbye. Mm. And he's like, well, since you mention it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Kind of like, yeah. And it set up the moment that she has when she goes back to her dad. And he's like, wait, this guy who robbed the place, who you drove home, did he try to molest you at all? And she was like, oh. Little. <laughs> yeah, not much. Of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not much, right. And I think it's just, I don't know, it's just interesting because it, it is like that coyness that is like of the time mm-hmm. where the women like fight back or like resist, yeah. but they actually like want it. Yeah. And it's just, that to me is just like such a weird gray area that can lean in a bad yeah. into a, like a bad area yeah so i that well, that's makes fair. me uncomfortable even when it's like no she i think she was like of course attracted to him and liked him obviously mm-hmm. it was a love story but still when she's that's like, why the first thing we see are his clear blue eyes <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. and but the other one i was gonna say was uh she gets proposed to by davis leland some rich asshole yeah and he just like kind of Booms in and proposes to her, and he proposes to her, I think, because that way, if they're married, he gets to own the statue. Oh, yeah. And it's just like, come on, man. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not an art collector. I am a collector, but not of art. <laughs> but I can't imagine a single thing that I'd be like, well, I'm going to put everything else on my life in my life aside because I need this one thing. Seriously. Yeah. I mean... I don't know, Corsica. How well, about you? What What's something that you would stop your entire life, risk everything for this one objet de art or something? I don't know. For like a, I mean, your cookies are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it's very kind, but you can just take them. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, that's that's tough. I think that is like was just part of his identity, you mm-hmm. know, of just 
obsessive compulsive yeah and just when he has when he wants something he takes it which is almost like proposing to her too just yeah. like just like, has it and is gonna take everything mm-hmm. in his way to get it or you know you know a rich guy yeah exactly cool yeah. um <laughs> i guess before we get into plot because you've been watching this movie since you were a kid is that kind of why you wanted to talk about it because you were previously on to remake uh sherlock jr oh yeah and you were like next time we're definitely doing how to steal a million <laughs> i was like okay <laughs> yeah i mean i just it's so fun and it is so like it i don't it's hard to explain but it's like sherlock jr to me is precious and it's fun to remake but there's some movies that are just they would be different you mm-hmm. know and it's it's kind of like this just feels I don't know, it just feels broadly fun and just based on i guess it's just so s- smart and um it, it just seems like a remake could add so much to it or just you know be i don't know the the modernization of it just seems really appealing to yeah. explore i guess I, you know I, and i think i agree it's a movie that succeeds at what it's doing in mm-hmm. the time but enough things have changed in the nearly 60 years since yeah that it's like, yeah, this would function differently. Let's talk about it. Right. But yeah, it. plus there's the whole aspect of like, it's really white. Let's diversify it up. Yeah. But I, so I have Even the gender. I, too, I, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I did that a little. I could have stood to do it I more. I didn't do it at all, but oh. I can just think of some now. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the, I, I have the IMDb Pro pulled up right now. One of the things that mm. I find really silly is that it's Audrey Hepburn in a particular outfit holding a particular tool. And at no point in the movie does she wear the outfit or use that tool. Really? In fact, I don't even think that tool gets used at all. Whoa. It's, I'm going to turn my computer yeah. around slightly. Oh yeah, that poster. That's so true. I've never, I've never looked at that. Because I don't think she ever wears that, and she definitely never uses one of those, like, hand drills. Yeah, I wonder if that's, like, a deleted scene, but I don't know when she would, when she would wear that. Yeah, maybe that is just, like, maybe in that, they just, like, did that purely for, um... The poster? I mean, it's an artist rendition. It's one of those things where, like, movies now, there will be scenes and trailers that don't make it to the final cut of the movie. Right, right. I mean, outside of anything else... Uh, Audrey Hepburn delivers much slay during this movie. Like, her outfits are ridiculous. It was all Givenchy that styled her. I don't know who that is. It's a, um, like a big designer. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's why there's the joke in there when he puts the maid, uh, costume on her and he said to give Givenchy a night off. Oh. Because they styled her whole wardrobe for her, all of her costumes very clever. for that film. Yeah. I like that joke a lot now that I get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, did... Like, are those, like, regular clothes, or did... Because they still mean, look nice, like, you know, Well, there's but the, the one where she there. shows up to, like, contract uh, Peter O'Toole to, like, oh, to hire yeah. him, and she shows up, and you're just like, what? <laughs> yeah. You... Like, and it's damn. Just like, damn. <laughs> yeah. And then you... I just noticed this time, like, she has, like, stunning, like, sparkly silver eyeshadow on, mm-hmm. it looks like, and it was, like... It looked, like, thick, but it was, like, yeah. really cool. Well, that was lace. part of why put covering her right, covering her right, up right. in, like, the washroom, and I was like, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice try, yeah, yeah, yeah. but no. Right, right, right. <laughs> I know, and it's intimidating to be like, okay, well, who's gonna, who is the Audrey Hepburn of today? Like, it's like, it's oh my tough. gosh, yeah. Anyway, let's take a step back and let's talk yeah, about yeah, yeah. the plot of this movie. So, how does this movie open? It opens in the house with her and her father. I think it opens right? with the auction first. Oh, that's right. It is the auction. You're right. Yeah, of the art that's selling. Mm-hmm. And it's and he's uh, Charles Bonnet. Um, it's his piece and he's watching it get sold. Yeah, he's selling something from his private collection. Right. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I did they say it was a Renoir or a... Um, I forget. Or which, Vin... Yeah, it's... it's those it's are like definitely both ones that he... The British pronunciation of Van, Van Gogh, Van which Gogh. is Van Gogh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is always interesting to me. Yeah. Um, that was, I mean, that was definitely one of his, like, he was most proud of his van, of his van go, so. Yeah. So they go so. back, Audrey Hepburn gets home, she goes mm-hmm. up to the, mm-hmm. the secret attic in yeah, their, in their the, like, lovely the house. Hero. yeah. And she sees her dad painting, and it turns out he's a master, uh, forger. Right. Can we talk about their house for a second? Yeah. It's stunning. That <laughs> it's means really he must nice. have sold a lot of this art. Yeah. It's like begs. It's just like what? What did he do? Like you know, to mm-hmm. build his fortune and to like have the status of like 
this. Well, year it also sounds collection. like it's generational because the the big um, MacGuffin of the movie is this the, yeah. fake statue, this Venus modeled of after something her grandma. And her grandfather did it modeled modeled after the grandma. Right, so it right, sounds right. like art forgery has been in the family for quite some yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just this fortune built on forgery. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, well, the dad and the dad talks about how proud he is because, and I've heard stories like this before where it's an art forger who loves seeing their piece in a museum because i painted that and people believe i am as good as this master Mm -hmm. and he talks about how van gogh uh (laughs) in his entire life only sold two pieces and i've sold three of van gogh's (laughs) paintings yeah 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 and i just think it's incredible and i just i love that yeah and that the the father is such an interesting guy like I don't, I've never seen that actor in in anything. I don't think anything else. But his face is like he's got he has like, a great bug face. eyes and mustache, and he's just so perfect for that like that role. It's so kooky and his name is uh, Hugh Griffith, and uh, his IMDb top things are Ben Hur, oh. Oliver, and Tom Jones. Hmm. And that leads me to believe that in Oliver, he's got to be Fagin. I could only see him being Fagin with that facial hair, sure. his massive goatee. I'm not as familiar with that, but he, yeah, his face is just so... Fagin's the one that kind of runs the orphan thief operation. Okay, yeah, 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 that would make sense. He's just the, kind of like uh, you've got to pick a pocket or two. Mm. Cool, yeah. Large your man's down there on trees, <laughs> got to pick a pocket or two. He does, he seems so, like, conniving, but endearing yeah, yeah conniving but jovial and it's like ah yeah. oh, you scallywag <laughs> yeah just don't do it again right, right. i won't <laughs> yeah because even at the end of the movie when simon mcdermott's like i literally work for the government and i'm a detective who is paid to find people like you don't do this again or i will send you to jail and the dad's like okay and then his cousin arrives and then as he's leaving <laughs> the, a guy from south america unquote. shows yeah. up to buy more art <laughs> yeah. it's great yeah yeah ah, i love the this is a tangent but it just made me think of it because it's in those moments the like i don't know what instrument it is it's almost like a um I want to say like a drum or like a string in- instrument, but it's like a doing like when it's like when like the guy comes in and he's like, okay, we're going to have to like do an investigation on the statue and prove it's real. They're both just like, <gasps> and it's like this like no, this like yeah. just note that they play and it's just hol- like weirdly out of place and hilarious. And I think that's at the end again too. <laughs> it's it's like... also one of those things where it's like, if it was a cartoon, I could see them doing this, but like the way the contract worked is it was a massive sheet of paper that had been folded like basically i'm holding an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and i unfold that so now it's double the size and then i unfold that yeah, so it's yeah. double the size again and that's the contract and i'm yeah. just like that's a massive contract <laughs> it is the whole thing is very cartoonish which i think i loved like yeah. as a kid and i still do today <laughs> and but like and if it was a cartoon you just keep unfolding keep unfolding oh, keep yeah. unfolding and yeah, it's just yeah. like this pages and pages and pages but as a single sheet <laughs> There is actually a Buster Keaton skit about that. Is there really? <laughs> yeah. He opens a newspaper and he's like, it's, it, it just keeps unfolding and he gets up on the top of the bench to like try to read it all <laughs> and then he falls over. It's great. <laughs> That's good. I like that. That's very funny. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. So as we're moving through, we kind of discover that he is this uh, art thief and uh, Audrey Hepper, Nicole Bonet is, you know, so French. Um, extremely ex- the, just the most French definitely you can tell because of their accents uh, she grew up in Paris she was born there <laughs> um, uh, they like she's kind of like worried that her dad's gonna get caught because he keeps doing this and he keeps taking bigger and bigger risks and then someone shows up from a museum from a museum to to because they want to have on exhibit this statue that mm-hmm. he made the and Venus. she's like the Venus mm-hmm. and Audrey Hepburn's like you can't put a statue on display they, they can identify fake statues so much easier now. Paintings, I see you're getting away with. You're getting the right pigments. You're de- getting them from the right yeah, time. You're, you're doing okay. You're going too far with this statue, yeah. But the statue, you're going to get found out. Like, yeah. they just look at it, they'll find out. Or look, if they do the, even the most cursory inspection, he's like, yeah, but it's a museum. Why would they? Yeah, right. And good question. Uh, <laughs> and so it gets taken away. Audrey Hepburn almost tries to smash the statue so it can't uh, get out of the house, but it's just kind of like a comedic bit and it gets stopped and then the statue's gone and it's like, well, that's unfortunate. Yep. 
And so then there's this big opening. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, this statue. And Audrey Hepburn stays home because uh, why would she go to something like that? And while she's home, an art thief shows up. <laughs> a well-dressed art thief. That's right. And it's tuxedo yeah. for some reason. <laughs> I know. It's never explained. Yeah, it's true. Maybe he was at the opening and then... Like to confirm that the dad was there? Yeah, maybe. Or I could just, do that. Maybe he just likes to dress nice. I mean, if he's a gentleman thief. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Um, and then she has the whole thing with the little gun. She gets the gun down from the plaque on the wall and mm-hmm. tries to like, and gets it all tangled in the phone. And I love her whole performance in that, in that bit, like dropping the boot with the cigarette and just like her like reluctance yeah. is like, just is funny. It's so good. Yeah. Cause she finds him uh, and stops the robbery and like threatens him with this gun. She got off the wall and finally it's like, all right, fine. Put the gun down. She's like, it's not even loaded. Puts it down. Blam. Goes off. <laughs> yeah. Grazes his arm. <laughs> yeah. It's, a their, great their scene. whole banter with that too because then it's like she drives him home and he, he's like ah and she's like it's your other arm and <laughs> it's just like the between the banter that that they have you and know, you keep it's... thinking why are you bringing him home and she's like anything to avoid publicity if they found out that there was a, a an art thief here they would want to inspect our art right, and right so it's right. just doing like they're both kind of operating with secret motives. Yeah. Which definitely. is the best way to have a scene. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's one yeah, of the first things they teach you in oh, yeah. uh, improv. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. It's yeah. One, one of the games is like, you get a piece of paper with this, like, you get the suggestion to have to do this scene, but you have a piece of paper with like, whatever your secret motivation is, is like, mm. secretly, your three kids stacked on top of each other, or uh, <laughs> secretly, you've never been this hungry in your entire life, or like one of those, like, it's it, yeah, yeah. from silly to weird. Or they are, you are secretly their child. <laughs> and but that's basically what the scene is. It's, he turns out to secretly be an agent of the government trying to bring this family down. Mm-hmm. And she secretly is not wanting to be brought down. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. It's really, yeah, it's perfect. And it's through the whole movie. And you know, you don't know his... But you're like suspicious. Well, you see him oh, take no, he... a flake of the of yeah. the paint off, and you see him go home and like yeah, and study it. And you see him talking with the authorities, right? But they never specifically say he's a detective. They just say that he's a expert on this sort of situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 something like that. Yeah. But anyway, then the museum shows up to insure the painting. I right, don't remember what sign... motivates that. Yeah, it's just the inspector comes to have him sign a like. Um... Insurance. insurance yeah saying, just being like you it's you'll get paid and they like you know he doesn't mention the yeah the, anything. we need He's to insure like, this this statue for a million dollars if something goes wrong it's and, not even you need to he was like do you want to it was like i think it was a choice he was yeah. like you know i came over for you to sign insurance if you want the piece insured it would protect it from theft and this and this and this and they like look at each other and they're like I yeah guess whatever that's sure. fine like why bother reading a massive <laughs> yeah. eight by eight sheet of paper? Yeah. And so then they sign it. And then that's when the like, boing. <laughs> yeah. Because he's like, and now you, we have to do the and investigation. And you, by this, signing this, you've just authorized it. Yeah. This insurance like, policy oh will kick in as soon as the authentic, the uh, <laughs> yeah, authentication yeah. Oh, yeah, process yeah, 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 is yeah. complete. Yeah. They're like, oh. And I read a book. So when we were growing up and we did road trips and stuff, we always listened to either the Cat Who or the Burglar Who. Oh, okay. I've never heard of they were just like kind of like pop audiobook kind of things. And I remember there was one where it was all about art forgeries and someone had a forgery. And that's kind of where I had like the whole really proud of an art forgery hanging in a museum because it was in this book. Mm, cool. And they talked about how someone owned a forgery and it was kind of just sitting in their home and it was stolen and insurance was refusing to pay out. And the Whoa. the thief was like, no, 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 no. They paid the premium on it, and they continued paying the premium on it, and you accepted those premiums. And yeah. because you expected the, accepted the payments of the insurance, it's insured for right. whatever the amount. Wow. The legitimacy doesn't matter. They paid for a policy, right. and you on have to item. honor it. Wow, yeah. that's so interesting. Yeah. And it ended up being like a big, like, one thing flips leads to another and like a a second fake ends up in the museum and the real one ends up in the burglar's like den (laughs) and it was very funny but i just like i was thinking about that the entire entire the entire time they were talking about the insurance of i was just thinking about this book i listened to 20 25 years ago whoa yeah yeah i know i it definitely seems like more suited for the film that it's like 
And now we have to test it because yeah. it is kind of like, yeah. Well, it makes total sense. They, yeah. Yeah. To just make sure it's authentic and like. Especially if it's in a museum. company deciding to do it. Right. A right. million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think to look up what that is in today money. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it's at least 1.5. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure it's a lot of money. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Wouldn't have a clue. All right, I'll look it up. <laughs> Was it a million? I mean, that is the title, but I thought they said something like, "No, it is." I'm sure it is. A million dollars in 1966 is equivalent in purchasing power to about nine million one hundred forty-five thousand today. Whoa! Uh, this would be how to steal nine million i mean why not just round up how <laughs> no, to steal 10 million because <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things i was thinking of like honestly we have to have a conversation of is it worth it to steal a million today because mm-hmm. i mean that'll last you a few years right but yeah, you can't live really, on it yeah forever like you can't live on it forever stone, yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless you're gonna use that to pay for the next one mm-hmm, right which also would be very funny yeah no 10 million seems more feasible but it's not just that like she was saving her father she wasn't yeah. like after the money but and like it's a great name how to steal a million is very very funny because they're stealing the statue which is insured for a million dollars and then of course that doesn't get paid out because it was never authenticated right right. so the million doesn't even happen yeah it's not stealing a million it's just catchy title yeah it has nothing to do with the film itself and it's yeah and having a movie called how to protect your art forger dad i don't think has the same ring to it and gives a little bit too much away yeah i think yeah i think they picked right it's not the uh the catchy audrey hepburn title we expect (laughs) uh these days yeah doesn't rank up at the same le- level as Roman Holiday or <laughs> Breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> Both of which are movies I've seen, actually. Good for me. Yeah. I normally don't see movies, but now I do. <laughs> <laughs> for whatever reason, I... When I first sat down, I thought I was going to be Catherine Hepburn in the movie. And then when Audrey Hepburn oh. showed up, I was like, I don't think they look that alike. This is probably <laughs> just Audrey. <laughs> and I was thinking about it. This is the first Audrey Hepburn movie we've talked about on the podcast but it's not the first peter o'toole movie oh really a few years ago my friend chris o'connor came on and we remade a movie called high spirits oh okay i haven't heard of that it's not that well known but it's peter o'toole liam neeson oh no now i'm forgetting uh uh um the guy from cocoon and the woman from splash oh steve gutenberg yeah and (laughs) this is embarrassing (laughs) i'm the worst with this I've been getting better, but Daryl Hannah. Yeah. And I'm getting better, but I'm still not great, obviously. (laughs) And it's like all of them together. And this movie is so popular that it's available completely for free on YouTube. (laughs) That's how you know how how, uh, well known and respected it is. Yeah, 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 definitely. But it's fun. And it's Peter O'Toole and like older Peter O'Toole. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And it's basically them going and staying in a haunted house. And. Then it turns out, it, like, it's a fake haunted house that then turns out to be really haunted. Oh. And that's just kind of act one. And then act two is them just resolving issues with the ghosts. <laughs> I really want to see that, actually. That sounds very Free fun. on YouTube. <laughs> worth your time. High spirits? High spirits. That sounds funny. Because it's a play on words, you see, because they drink things. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think. So anyway, they, Audrey Hepburn wants nothing to do with, uh, with Peter O'Toole. Because he's a thief. Mm-hmm. And then this this insurance thing is going to go into effect. And the only thing that could prevent it is if the Theft. statue's not there anymore. And right. they can't do the inspection. So she goes and contacts the thief again. Her, she knows yes. where he's staying because she drove him home. Mm-hmm. Which is very funny. Mm-hmm. The script is so tight. It really is. <laughs> it's just every little piece fits together. Uh-huh. And nothing can be missing. I know. It's very good. I know. It really is. It fits so perfectly. But anyway, they steal... The thing, everyone gets away. They, they fall in love. <laughs> Look, happily really ever wrap after. that up. Quick. A- A- Audrey Hepburn. Well, I realize we have to start talking about our oh, version. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Audrey Hepburn like gets a taste for it, and so you think, mm-hmm. oh, she might try to steal more things, or now she can lie. And but that's the end of the movie. Yeah, and it's yeah. very cute and lovely. She's gonna join in the family biz. <laughs> yeah, or uh, or pivot. Yeah, or just you know, take it steal in new directions. The art from the family business. If you steal the art back, you can sell it again. It's true. You get the insurance and get to that's true. Sell it again. It's just yeah, that's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think we should do for our version of this movie? What do you mean? What do you think we should do? Well, we're remaking this movie. Mm-hmm. So, what are the things that need to be updated? The technology, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some things that are present and are not present in the movie as it is? Um, what do you mean? So, 
in the movie as it is, the security system is basically, they say it's lasers going from the bottom to the top. And you're like, okay, we believe you, 1966. You're familiar with the term laser. Yeah. That's fine. But basically all the guards just hang out in the guard room and play cards and eat dinner. Well, it's interesting because I do think that that is still a little accurate. You do? I kind of do. Like, I think the technology has changed, but I think people have stayed the same. So, like, I think, like, especially since because technology has changed, I think we're just more dependent on it. So I think, like, they're in the, like, in the room watching, watching the, the monitors. Watching the monitors. But are they watching the monitors? Like, if you think about this as, like, a place where there hasn't been a robbery or, like, it's been monotonous and mundane for, like, years maybe months at least on end you know like they might you know have like they might glance away or like be on their phone or there's just so many like you know they don't have their full focus necessarily on it um or you know there might be like a shift change at some point and they would chat a little like they're not like aware that something's gonna happen so i think there still are those moments of like human like you know yeah i uh, i distraction I 80 to 90% agree with you, but then there's that other part of my head that's seen Night at the Museum. <laughs> yeah. And that's the only part that disagrees. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, definitely. And it's hard because everything's covered with technology. So it that's is exactly like, it. even if humans are, you know, like get lazy or like, you know, aren't good at their job, the technology is better and takes mm-hmm. that place, you know. And you talk about how, like, I think, so take the Getty here in LA and you and people have talked about how like if there's a fire I've heard this I don't know if it's true I don't know how this would work but if there's a fire there's something that like rigs and the paintings can drop into a secure thing so that the fire can't get them. Oh, I think I've heard that too. And I think it also just might be one of those like yeah. LA things right, and like right. oh the Getty is earthquake proof. And yeah, I'm like yeah. it's on a hill. <laughs> it can't possibly be earthquake proof. <laughs> yeah, like What's going to, like, someone's going to come and just hold it up. Yeah. And it's, like, it's surrounded and, like, it has been, the Getty building has been surrounded by fire before. And everyone was super nervous, like, a few years ago when there were just, like, the massive wildfire along the 405. And it was, like, "Mm, it's getting close to the Getty. (laughs) Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. But. I think also, I think there's, like, less trust in people (laughs) now. I think that's true, too. And so I think any art, especially for a museum, is like insurance or not is going to be tested for accuracy. Like, I don't think that there's any, or even sold at auction. Like, I don't think that you can really be like, yeah, this is from my private collection. So they're going to be like, Oh, that's all we need to know. Okay. Well, the other thing is that like, they never say the word that I was expecting them to say, which is provenance. Provenance is the history of the piece. Okay. You've had this piece, but for how long, when did you get it? Right. When one of the worst jobs I ever had was I had a, I was supposed to be a sales assistant, but that ended up just becoming like helping my boss sell his possessions on eBay and Craigslist because he was slowly (laughs) going broke and didn't know what else to do. And all of his possessions were just like in a storage facility and he just had one picture of each of them and the pictures weren't great. And I remember, to let you know what kind of guy this guy is, uh, one of the things he tried to have me sell was a polar bear skin rug. Which I still have a picture of in my phone that oh I can show you after gosh. this. And Real? Oh, yeah. Ugh. Everything. Like, he had ostrich boots and he had, like, a stuffed crocodile. Oh and this is a guy gosh. This is a guy who had been very, very wealthy. And then uh, it turns out the person who was really good at his business passed away. And then he'd kind of just been circling the drain since then. He had, like, a mm. house in Malibu and a house in, in like, Bel Air. Wow. And it was... He had been wealthy, but it was kind of, like, diminishing. Also, not really a nice guy. Oh. Um, but... I had been looking it up and like, you can't really sell a polar bear skin rug. That's super illegal. And I looked it up and it's super illegal. Oh, I didn't know. I, I mean, that makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. And uh, one of the things was the law is, is that if you had purchased it prior to 1989 or something, you could still sell it because it was before it was illegal. Right. Instead of just like something like, it, it can't be a recent polar bear. It has to be an sure. older polar bear. Right, right, right. And so... <laughs> He would say, oh, yes, of course. Uh, I, I bought it at the yard sale in 1988. And I'm like, you have to be able to prove that. Conveniently one year before. <laughs> yeah. I, and literally everything he bought at a yard sale in 1988 for $10,000. Oh, my god. Pair gosh. of boots, the, this, that, the other thing. Everything was bought at a yard sale. But basically, in order to sell these different things, you need to be able to talk about the history. Yeah. And, like... And even have proof t- of it. Yeah, yeah. Even today with, like, 
cars that's right. expected because like that's the whole car facts thing of like looking up your report and seeing like well what damage has been done to the car what's been repaired on the car mm-hmm. and, and especially for a museum like especially yeah and they talk about like there's documentaries just going on and on and on I'm like okay here is the history of this piece here's where it came from who's it's on who it's on loan from when their family got it 300 years ago and it's tracking everything mm-hmm. Because they're going through and digitizing all of these, like, historic contracts from, like, city governments. And, like, you're seeing, like, the whole journey and process. And it's super interesting. Yeah. But it makes it harder to to fake stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just in our, the, like, information age, it's, like, everything, it's, like, all about kind of, like, trying to find, you know, truth, too. You know, it's just, like, there's so many people... I mean, you know, the, I, more and more people are trying to create mm-hmm. f- fraud and, and trying yeah. to, like, trick people. And it's just kind of like people I, are more suspicious of that. I just watched the Beanie Mania documentary and they talked about the real prevalence of, of uh, <laughs> counterfeit Beanie Babies during the whole height of the Beanie Boom. Oh, my God. There's a woman who still makes money authenticating Beanie Babies. And you know what? I respect her. <laughs> like, still, at the end of the documentary, she's like... I still get one or two a week of Beanie Babies to authenticate, and I'll still do it. So this remake is going to be about Beanie Babies. I would assume nothing less. We're, we are going to baby. we are going to have a heist for peanut for the royal blue peanut the elephant. Yeah. It, everyone's expecting the Princess Diana bear, but those are a dime a dozen. I'm talking royal blue peanut the elephant. How to steal a peanut? That, that actually would be great. Honestly. I mean, I would. That's hilarious. I would watch that. <laughs> I would definitely. We should watch write that because that's just a very funny. Because I'm idea sure for Beanie Babies are in a museum somewhere. Oh it's yeah, like part of history, and of it's course. like yeah. So if like you know a forger got so good and so proud, like and Charles Bonnet, it's like well, this Beanie Baby belongs in a museum because I'm great. Exactly, and some of them are so like even now, even now, now that they're worth nothing, there are still some I assume that are still worth because it's like this one was always the rarest one. And right. if you're going to own a Beanie Baby, says this rich person, I may as well own the rarest one. God, Beanie Babies. I definitely had my phase where I was, like, really hoping, like, as a kid, I just accidentally bought, like, those super, like, valuable <laughs> one. And I just went uh, through just... all mine again and was like, dang it. Yeah. I A couple summers ago, I did the same thing and just went through and was like, apparently some of these are still worth something. So I'll put those aside oh, and just yeah. gave the rest away. Yeah. Like, they're definitely Beanie Babies in this room we're sitting in right now. <laughs> But yeah, mine are in a box somewhere at my parents' house. Yeah, that yeah. had been mar- ours, and my mom was like, "No," and I was like, "You." She was like, "You can go through them, but we're gonna get rid of them." And I was like, "Okay." <laughs> oh. So I still have a few, but yeah. I mean, now you have to ask the question of which was your favorite. I can't remember. There was like a tie dye one. I really like the tie dye. Garcia bear, the I bear. Think. You know a lot about I, baby babies. <laughs> I what's well, there was Garcia the bear, which was tie dye, and then Peace the bear, which had a peace symbol. I definitely that one yeah. sticks out. I okay. I don't. I wouldn't say it's necessarily my favorite, but it's one that is the one you remember most presently in my memory. Yeah. yeah. My so everyone liked Spooky the ghost, which is sitting there on that shelf. Oh yeah. And then my favorite was always Peanut the not Peanut. Peanut is the elephant below, but right above him is Speedy the turtle. Oh yeah. Oh my god, nostalgia attack. <laughs> I need to go look at all my beanie babies now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but anyway, one of the things that I think we can get away with is Oh, every... there was a platypus, wasn't there? Like a Patty purple the platypus. Yeah, that mm-hmm. one. Definitely. Yeah. I think that's my favorite. And there's also Patty the platypus could also be one of the super rare ones cuz it was purple, but that if you got a magenta one. Right. Yeah, I had the purple one. Yeah, so did yeah. we. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, tangent. Uh, no, it's good. Um, so one of the things that that does happen every now and again is they'll like they'll find an old like one of those lost to time things. Like it's plot. It's a plot in a Simpsons episode where it's the the curse of the health flying hellfish or something with mm. the the Abe Simpson like discovering like an old uh, like they had a tontine and they locked away this art that they stole during World War Two forever. But it's like you take something like the Dead Sea Scrolls where like you go to this place and you found this like perfectly preserved thing. So there is no provenance. It's just this old history. And so I feel like you can get away with like let's because this is a familial story of two, three generations ago, their family knocked down a wall in the basement and it turned out it was the back to a safe for art that for someone who had lived there centuries before and it's Mm -hmm. like oh my gosh we found all this painting i we didn't even know this existed but it was clearly an art collector and we have no way of uh, 
verifying any of this, sure. but a hundred years ago we found this art. Yeah, yeah. And now some of it we're going to keep, some of it we're going to sell to kind of help our family. And then you can trace it back and like every once in a while it's like because they kept it secret the whole time, it's they like can always sell one little piece from their private collection or loan out another mm-hmm. piece because no one really knows and they've never let anyone in. Yeah. And it's a highly secretive family with this amazing art collection and this amazing story. Mm-hmm. And of course it can turn out that the entire story is fictional. Right. And every single piece is fake. Right. But they would still, I feel like if that's the case, then they would bring in people to like try to sample it and find like ver- verification i think that would be it, true but... if they found it today oh right. but if it's something where they found it 80 years ago yeah yeah then it's just kind of been like one been... of those stores and stores stories and lore mm-hmm. you combine that to stores <laughs> uh that has existed just like in the art world of like this family just like they found this thing 100 years ago and that's yeah. why every every art family in the world whenever they buy a house at the basement they knock down all the walls yeah right right yeah. And you create a legend around the family and then it turns out that the legend no one, was like questions it. Yeah. Yeah. And so and so that's why they're able to kind of like get away with discovering that they have these old Van Goghs mm. or whatnot. Yeah. Or I was thinking even in this film too, it's like if they're generational too, even if they weren't discovered, maybe like the grandfather or even maybe great grandfather like made up a history then yeah. so then at the time when no one could really disprove it or like forged history documents mm-hmm. then those actually could take the place you know of yeah. like any verification because especially now you take someone like van gogh or monet or whatever like every single piece they ever made is now cataloged and it we either know where it yeah. is or it's lost right 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 and so we know their entire history yeah and so if you are adding to history you can't just say oh i found this long lost thing oh did you yeah <laughs> Right. We'll see. When did he do that? Yeah. Because that's what it kind of felt like in this movie is he wasn't forging existing pieces of art. He was creating new pieces of art in the style of the original artist. Because it was adding to the history of mm. the artist and not duplicate. Because you didn't see him painting Starry, Starry Night or whatever. Yeah. It was some new piece that looked like Bingo. it would have been done by the right, artist. Right, right. Yeah. I guess I just assumed I didn't know all of Van Gogh's work and I assumed it was one that was... Like the statue, for sure. Yeah, but I statue... kind of assumed that it was like a one of Van Gogh's that I just didn't know about. But even the statue, it's modeled after Audrey Hepburn's grandmother. Right, right. So it's not. But it had clout. I'm blanking on like how they knew about it. Whether I it was just like in just... his, it was just was in his collection for so long that yeah. they thought it was like. I think that's it. Because like... it was Cellini, right? They claimed it was. Was Cellini's it okay? I didn't Venus. remember the artist. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if Cellini has a Venus. And if yeah, I right. look it up, we'll find out. If We'll also find out right now in this moment if I know how to spell Cellini. <laughs> the Venus by uh, Benven- Benvenuto yeah. Cellini, yeah. Art Renewal Center. Oh, so it's uh, real. Where is the Cellini Venus? Cabinet of Drawings, uh, the Louvre in Paris. Ooh. So apparently that is a real thing. Huh. Uh, and there's real pictures of it. Uh, three of three pictures of different statues <laughs> and then a picture from this movie. Yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. Like, y- you just say, oh, it is. So I think the Cellini Venus you could still forge today and get away with it. Pro- well, if, if, it if they didn't have it in a museum, because I'm now looking right, at right, right. Uh, the Venus by yeah, yeah. Cellini in bronze and he made it sometime mm. and his life was 1500 to 1571. Whoa. And so I'm now looking at it, and it's definitely a naked lady. Yeah. It could be someone's grandma. Apparently. Huh. Yeah. So what you could do is, what I think they've done for some art pieces like this before is the finished pieces in bronze, but he practiced in stone or ceramic. Mm. So here is one of the, uh, like, the templates. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because isn't that the case with uh, with David? Of like, there's the David, and then there's the, like the ones where he practiced. Yeah, there's the one like outside the mm-hmm. government. Thi- uh, building and a lot of people still. think that that is right. it, but right. it's not. Because yeah. why would you put the statue outside? <laughs> well, the original was outside. At first. They're crazy. <laughs> and then they moved it inside. Fine. <laughs> but yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. Um. So I feel like you can get away with by like creating your own story yeah. around the pieces, and then do we like what else? Like, other than the nature of the security system, what else do we need to change? I'm wondering, 
I feel like the cleaning crew would still be the same, mm-hmm. but I don't know that they would have like buckets and like they probably are a little more well equipped. Yeah. Or like have like a f- maybe less people too, which might be. I it mean, wouldn't quite be the same. They talked about how they cleaned the entire museum every night from midnight until 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. That is crazy. Because what I think happens is I think they clean museums like that in sections. Mm-hmm. Yeah, rotating. Yeah, and it's like the East Wing one on Monday, the West Wing on Tuesday, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And it's a rotating thing because I don't think these things need to be cleaned every single night. Right. And I think we know now that you shouldn't clean them every night or like you have to have a professional restoration people. Yeah. Uh, do cleanings. Yeah, and it's just anything, like letting this group of women in. Yeah. <laughs> it just seemed like they were like... And so we talked about how it needs to have a higher level of security. So how how are we going to get past that higher level of security? Because there's going to be cameras everywhere. Right. Well, I think it would be... It would almost... I would feel like it would take a little more knowledge in terms of like hacking like normal kind of heist movies because I feel like you'd have to be able to shut off the cameras or like tap into the computer system somehow to like be able to turn it off or but I feel like you could you could even still like go with the psychology of it and create a distraction somewhere else Mm -hmm. on one of the cameras and then on other cameras just have it be like something that appears normal but is like you know Audrey Hepburn just cleaning and it's like you would see that and not think anything of it and meanwhile have something like very uh, unnatural or distracting on like another camera to like just draw like draw attention where you want it to like away from yourself. I have two suggestions. Yeah. The first suggestion is a way that you can kind of like start setting off alarms Mm -hmm. like all over the place. Yeah. And it would be super mundane and they'd be like, I, we can't deal with this tonight. Mm-hmm. And it's to... Well, the goal is to have them turn everything off. Right. So it would be to annoy yeah. them. And you could do that by accidentally getting pigeons or birds into the museum. Mm-hmm. Now, pigeons and birds are very dangerous for a museum because they can poop on stuff and they can yeah. like peck Knock at things. Into stuff. Yeah. But they also would be flying around setting off alarms and like proximity yeah, alarms because yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't remember the last time the cameras you... probably move with motion too so my might... maybe i didn't even think about that because that's going to be my second suggestion but i don't know when the last time you were in a museum but when you're there during the day like you even get close to something and there's someone oh, there going yeah. no, 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 no. yeah 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 no matter what the museum is no matter where it is yep it's true which is interesting yeah. but like you let birds in and like all of a sudden everything's getting set off and they're just gonna have to set shut the alarm down in order to catch them to prevent them from doing damage to the museum. Yeah, I think I think it it needs to like level up in the amount of chaos. Oh yeah. I think it just cuz it's there's so much that mm-hmm. it would need to really be something like that. Yeah, that just kind of attacks from all sides yeah. so that they need to like shut down. But you would all you would need to be inside. You need to be inside first. already. Yeah. yeah, well, you need to be inside make it to all the different places, release the animals, and then be in the one place that the animals aren't. Right. So here's my pitch for the cameras. We've already been talking about art forgery, so let's just take it to the next level. The movie that I remade just before this one is The Fifth Element. Ooh. Have have you seen The Fifth Element? Yeah, it's been a minute, but... Do you remember at the beginning of the movie when Bruce Willis, like, checks his, like, peephole and looks into the hallway and there's no one there, and then he opens his door and there's a guy there robbing him? who's wearing a picture of the hallway on top of his head. <laughs> that was what had been in the peephole. Uh, kind of like, like, oh, I'm seeing an empty hallway, but it was just a picture on this dude's head. Whoa, I forget if, that. If you're able to get in there and see what all the cameras are seeing, and let's assume they're static and not moving around, mm-hmm. or even if they are moving around and creating a curved... Yeah, you could just put something up in front of the... Forge what they're seeing and like mm-hmm. figure out a way to like attach things to all the cameras that have fake pictures or fake anything like because mm-hmm. you could even say well we need someone who can hack into the security system it's an unhackable security system what do you mean it's an unhackable security system i mean the entire thing is contained in the room and we can't and we can't get into the room because that's where the guards are mm-hmm. and like you can even because it's always relying on like well you just do the thing and you reroute it and you set the camera to loop and it's like well we can't do that yeah. Also, I don't know how. <laughs> yeah. But if we're already talking about art forgery, let's use art forgery to steal the forged art. Definitely. I do wonder, I I like that theory. I do wonder if the cameras have like a proximity sensitivity. Like if you put something like right in front of it, if it like would go off in that sense. 
But hey, like do it to all the cameras and then have them like, you know, have all the more alarms go off. Yeah. I don't, I'm sure in a modern museum, it's not just like one blaring klaxon for everything. (laughs) It's like itemized. It's like, oh, something's happening here. Something's happening here. Something's happening here. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we release enough birds and stuff in the rest of the museum that eventually they're not going to notice when something goes off in the room with the thing in that they want. Right, right. Because I feel like we got to have fun little, like we replace the boomerang with birds. Mm -hmm. We replace... I don't know, the something with, like, you can even ha- just, like, have him sneak back to the keys and, like, he press it into Play-Doh in order to make a duplicate of a key. Yeah, yeah. Which is something I've seen somewhere else, but it's still very funny. <laughs> yeah. Because even keys right now are, like, mechanical. Like, it, you can't just take a pressing of a key, like, a high-security key like that, because it, it, the key itself has, like, mechanical components in it. Yeah. I don't know. Technology's crazy. And, you, like, you do the thing with, like, the, the scanning the hand and scanning the eye, but right. most people know that those don't actually work. I know. Those are very easy to, like, yeah. the face one is apparently, like, the easiest hackable thing. Yeah, you literally ever. just take a, show a picture of yeah. the person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Done. Yeah. I do, I mean, I kind of feel like it's funny in, like, big museums and stuff, like, the technology gets more advanced, but the, like, architecture and the structure of the buildings stay the same. Yeah. So I do kind of feel like there would be, like, a still a small little closet with, like, a regular oh. key, you know, just because they aren't gonna, like, they, that's not, they're not concerned yeah, they're not gonna, with, like, closet locks. Of, they're like, not gonna the shut down an like, entire wing to renovate a closet. <laughs> yeah, so I almost think it'd be kind of funny to have, like, they're dealing with all this high-tech technology but then like the closet they hide in is actually like still pretty basic you know and it's even funnier if you stick them in this closet and it's like you you put the our audrey hepburn our nicole bonet in first and then peter o'toole keeps showing up with more and more and more birds so first it's (laughs) she's like i don't understand how this anyone's gonna fit in this closet it's just like just you wait (laughs) and it just gets more and more and more full with just the more birds and things that they're going to be releasing in the museum Mm -hmm. i agree we should do that because the closet seems so funny and it, it is, just... and I love that they they hide even further in the closet when the guard, like, comes and checks. Yeah. And you're like, oh, no, they're going to be, and they're just, like, back behind the ladder in, like, yeah. a little nook, and it's, like... It's great. It's just, yeah, it's, like, so practical. Yeah. And there, so there was the guard that's constantly checking the key, and then he goes and he resets the alarm and, like, takes a swig of wine. Yeah. And uh, I, I did recast that guard just because the name of the actor delighted me so much. Of the one that originally played him? Yeah. Yeah. I forget. It's like the m- Lou Moustache or something, isn't it? Yeah. So the, the, the character is Guard and yeah. the actor is just Mustache. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, what well, is Well, his mustache is pretty Yeah. Incredible. He's a mustache actor and yeah. I respect yeah. it. Yeah. He was a good... A- he was funny. He was great. He's very memorable. Yeah. Like, he is like, in my head, like a prominent character. And despite him movie. doing like four things. Yeah. He, yeah. And he never saying a word. Or like... He just epitomized like... Who, what was happening he is... he was like getting a drink like he's like on this job he doesn't mm-hmm. want to be on it he's taking any excuse he can to go take a swig like before he gets back to the you know it's like when uh when he gets told off by the head guard he, do- he like flips him off or like when the guard walks by he kind of just gestures of like after you i guess <laughs> yeah. just the physical comedy yeah. on this guy is so good so subtle and so lovely yeah. ah yeah, you just, he he was very expressive. Was, so I had to great. recast him because he was so good. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like I could I could never, I want to know who you, because I was like, I had a few ideas, but I he was so great. I, 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 yeah. Like, I mean, like in a perfect world, it would have been John Candy. Oh, yeah. But, definitely. Yeah. Oh, my god. So like, that's kind of where I was at when I was trying to come up with somebody. But yeah, what else do we need to talk about in terms of, like, because we also haven't really talked about... Davis Leland, the rich suitor. Mm-hmm. And I feel like some rich guy who barrels through everything is just as prevalent today as it as it was then. Mm-hmm. Even to other rich people like Nicole Bonet. Definitely. And I don't think we need to change that much. He's just some crazy obsessive rich guy. Right. And it just gives the motivation for Charles Bonet. Yeah. And it's just kind of that other side. I think, yeah, I don't think anything really would change. Like what else, what else is there that we both need or that we need to change? Where do you want to have this set, by the way? Oh, yeah. Where and when? I presume now is our is our is when we're having it set. Mm-hmm. But are we setting it in England? Are we setting it at the museums in 
Washington, D.C.? Are we setting it at one of the amazing museums here in Los Angeles, California? Right. That's so dependent on what the piece is. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Getty would be fun. The Getty would be fun. Just because we know it. Mm -hmm. I mean, kind of. um... And we can kind of play around with the the lore around the Getty that we were talking about earlier. Right, right. And there's the fun tram up there. That's the thing. That's the extra bit of difficulty with the Getty. To get back and forth to the Getty is you have to park at the bottom and then you have to take a tram up to the building and to get all those birds <laughs> and well that's exactly it like to get the birds up and down and you have the additional pro and the nice thing about the getty is it's multiple buildings mm-hmm. and once you escape since you can't take the tram you have to show our leads climbing down a hill next to the 405 yes and then they get to the 405 and they're just like stick out a thumb what do they do <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, they can't, yeah, we got to do the Getty. Them. The Getty's too funny. The Getty's fun, and it is like it makes sense if you're like setting off different alarms because you mm-hmm. would send them to other buildings. Yeah, you know, like it really would like separate away. And you can Scooby Doo the whole thing of like you can see the guards running from one building to the next <laughs> building, and then running <laughs> yeah. to the next building, and then running to the next like, building. That is like the tone of it too, for sure. And for people who don't know but are fans of the TV show The Good Place, mm-hmm. when they finally make it to The Good Place, yeah. they filmed that at the Getty. Oh, really? So yeah, so there's a city where they're the city a scene where they're just like kind of lounging outside in the good place just talking with lisa kudrow and uh they are just outside at the getty and i've sat there and i'm like yeah it's really nice (laughs) (laughs) it is a good place the getty is the good place yeah that's funny i didn't know that um okay so that lets us get away with not having to cast a non-french actress to play a french person Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah let's keep it american and we can also kind of track the lore a little bit of records weren't kept when things when these paintings were moved across the ocean because the, there were two ships the ship with the, with the artwork and the ship with the paperwork and the ship <laughs> with the paperwork went down so there yeah. the provenance doesn't go back far enough <laughs> yeah. and that's just part of the legend that they construct and create around it there, yeah that makes sense cool i don't think we need to talk about the story so much anymore just because we kind of like the movie as like a, a lot of the big pieces of forging the art and it's a family business Mm -hmm. they try to rob it because they're finally going to try and take it down and then it's a whole like bait and switch bait and switch bait and switch they Mm -hmm. do a robbery yeah and i think we're kind of good with that yeah definitely um so let's talk casting (sighs) (laughs) where do we start i mean we gotta start with nicole bonet we gotta start with audrey hepburn yeah yeah man the hardest one yeah well that was actually the one that I first, like I had. I was like, oh, it has to be this person. Really? And so, but then I th- I changed it. Ooh. Because my first thought was how old, how old is Audrey Hepburn? So, I don't know how old she is in the movie, but how right. old is she, she supposed to be playing? Right, right. That is a good question. I mean, it's also back in the day, too, when like family just lived together. It wasn't like she wasn't like so young that she hadn't moved out or anything. Like yeah. I... I pictured her in her, like, late, like, around 30, that's, weirdly. Like, late 20s, even. That's kind of what I pictured, too. Yeah. That's not strictly what I cast. Mm-hmm. No, but that's yeah. not why, that, that's why I didn't go with my first person. Okay. Um, the first person I thought was, well, of course it has to be Rashida Jones. Because <laughs> Rashida Jones kind of has that kind of, that's, like, yeah, that's good. style of, of, like, kind of dry wit comedy. Mm-hmm. While also being able to kind of play around with, like the kind of the grace of everything. Yeah. And just because that's kind of how I see Rashida Jones anyway. I didn't realize that Rashida Jones was 46. And I'm like, yeah. she doesn't look it. Right. But I wanted someone to go a little bit younger. I ended up casting someone who wasn't so much younger. My uh, mm. The actress I cast is 39. But she can play a little bit younger and we can kind of get away with it. But I ended up going with an actress who like kind of first broke in the TV show Humans. And she was in Crazy Rich Asians and most recently in Eternals. But that's Gemma Chan. Okay. Yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know her too much in her acting. Like, I, I can picture her face, but yeah. not, not like, a, so much in acting to know whether she'd be a good fit. Yeah. It, it was one of those things where it's like, you can go through and you can do, like, your A-list casting for the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Because in that case, you might just do Emma Stone, because that's kind of, like, especially yeah. after Cruella. Right. But it's like, is that who we want? Like, yeah. I know Audrey Hepburn was, like, Audrey Hepburn. Right. And I don't know where this movie falls in her whole filmography, later Mm because breakfast at tiffany's is 61 and this is five years later yeah and roman holiday is 53 charade is 93 so this is this is late audrey hepburn theoretically yeah whatever that means (laughs) Um, i i think i was leaning 
towards the like the what you were saying the competent incompetence of like the little aloofness that she was able to do and like the like quirkiness and I don't know if it's just because like a recency bias but the first thought that I had was um Selena Gomez Selena Gomez would be very fun and yeah. like especially with what she does and what we not what we do in the shadows only, uh, murders, only murders in the, in the, building. Building. In the building and that's what I've been I watched recently and uh, loved and she really impressed me in that and yeah, was just like so very good. like very different from what I've like, I mean, she acted when she was a kid in the Disney Channel, you know, and she's always in, like, poppier kind of, like, I don't know, I've always pictured her as just, like, happy, you yeah. know? But this, you know, in Only Murders in the Building, she's a lot more, like, sinister yeah, almost. Yeah, she's and, drier. Yeah. So she has that, like, that sarcasm, like, that wit, but is still almost, like, has that, like, innocence, that aloofness. Mm-hmm. I don't know. So that was, that was where I landed. I, I had, like, a few others, but I was, I like, I think Selena that's... Gomez is the right way to go, especially after... Only Murders in the Building, like, yeah. that's almost exactly the right tone right. for what we're looking for. Definitely, that's it. To start. And, yeah. then it, and then once that veneer breaks, then she can be sillier and more fun and more into it. And like, and once she's having fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think that's the way to go. I, th- I think you're absolutely right. Selena, the new Audrey. So I'm going to follow that up, not with Simon McDermott, but with Charles Bonet, simply because, yeah. because we're going with your Nicole, I feel like we're going to have to go with your Charles. Just because my uh, my Charles, like my Nicole, is also Chinese. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, so we can't go with Chow Yun-Fat, who Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, mm. Pirates of Caribbean, Caribbean at World End. I recently saw him in uh, Dragon Ball Evolution for this podcast. But he's like classic Hong Kong uh, cinema. He's very, very good. But I feel like we have to go with yours. Yeah, I... I also left it open in case maybe, like, her parents were, like, interracial. I was thinking, and that's where, like, the tone kind of, like, plays a big question. Because I was trying to think, like, who, who's, like, there's, like, some that's, like, darker humor, like, way more sinister. Like, I think, like, um, Willem Dafoe would almost yeah. be, like, really interesting. But I don't know that it, like, is quite the right tone to yeah. fit Selena. I think he's too evil and not silly enough. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's, like, yeah. Um, then may I make a recommendation? Definitely. What would you say to John Leguizamo? Oh, yes. Oh, my God. Thank you. That is so perfect. I was also thinking Benicio Del Toro, but that's also a little too sinister, yeah. I think. He's, like, a little too... John Leguizamo is one of those people he... who can who just... Can just yeah. turn on the silliness he and is. then just turn it off. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he's the clown in Spawn. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, he is very silly. That's so perfect. I love it. And he's good dad age for this yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a great dad for Selena. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Cool. All right, great. Then let's talk about Mr. Blue Eyes himself. I yeah. didn't cast someone with blue eyes. <laughs> but uh, Simon, Mc- uh, Simon I Dermott. I did. Uh, so tell me who you had. Ugh, I just had all kind of classic people because he is supposed to be charming in that sense. Charming and like, handsome. Yeah. Those so, are required characteristics. Yeah. I went like my two, I did like Tom Holland or even like Ryan Gosling just because they're just so like gentlemen. Mm-hmm. That's like, fair. in a suit, you know? Yeah. That's, uh, I went with someone who a previous guests of the show have come on and actively thirsted after. And I'm like, well, clearly he's got something. <laughs> so I went with Dev Patel. Oh, yeah. No, that's good. And especially because you can kind of play off the the gentleman thief. And that also turns out to be like a government agent. Yeah. And intellect. Yeah, yeah. I like that. And because he also can be he, very silly. He's exactly, a very funny, charming exactly, guy. Yeah. And then he's all three. Like yeah. he's like serious, charming, and mm-hmm. silly. Yeah, yeah. I so like that. I thought that'd be fun. And that's a good like age match for Selena. I yeah. Think. So when I was looking it up, I think Gemma Chan is thirty nine, and I think Dev Patel's thirty two. Oh, okay. So something like that. Yeah, yeah. And but it doesn't matter. Just as long as it's not like forty five and twenty. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to go back in time of that kind of age gap. Yeah. Okay, so the next person I have is Davis Leland, who is the rich suitor. So the person I have for this is kind of a one-for-one for for the character as he exists in the movie now. The person who plays him in the movie now 
uh, is Eli Wallach, who's yeah. very, very funny. Yeah. And I was going for kind of like the same sort of thing. And I cast someone who's not really well known. Like he's mm. kind of just broken through on a new TV show that I used last episode too, but I've been watching it a lot and I really like it. And that's the TV show Ghosts. Oh, yeah. And he plays, in the American version, the dude with the arrow in his neck. Okay. And he's just this sweet, nice, super jovial guy. <laughs> and that's who he plays in like his episode or two of What We Do in the Shadows, where I think he's one of the werewolves, and he's just a sweet, nice guy. He's also in something called uh, Pinkalicious and Peterific, and I don't know what that is, but it's a cartoon, <laughs> and I was like, that's funny. Yeah. So I went with this uh, actor named Richie Moriarty, just because he's a fun new person that's kind of just breaking now and i'm like that's get him to be the obnoxious adorable guy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. adorably obnoxious guy in this case instead of just like maliciously rich and uncomfortably so yeah it is really a fine a fine line of a balance with him Um, yeah i went for um which i still think fits in the tone we have going now of this like more silly vibe um i did uh jason schwartzman which is just so charactery, but I think he would just be so. I don't know if he would be believable as like you know this. I mean, as I mean this, he like, he plays a good sleaze. Yeah, and if that's what you're going for, he's going to do a good job. Yeah, and you can see him being a super obsessive, attached to like no, I have to have this piece of art. Right. I'm Jason Schwartzman. <laughs> And you, he just says that after every line. Like, he could literally not even play it. He can literally, his name can just be Jason Schwartzman. And I just picture him with his, like, I forget what it was that I saw him in, but he has, like, the slicked back hair. Yeah. I watched a lot of uh, Bored to Death. Um, <laughs> and the, the tone in that, he plays a detective. And so I guess I just, like, from, he just has that, like, that seriousness, but it's so, like, endearing because you're just, like, Well, you can also not... set him up to be, like, the high stakes character who gets, like, brought low all the time yeah the yeah, yeah, yeah. uh the, the sideshow bob of it all right sideshow bob stepping on a rake that that whole thing <laughs> yeah uh great i'm happy with that let's go cool. with jason schwartzman okay cool and he's like i think he's a little older too which yes. adds to that like Le- level a, of skeeziness it's not, yeah but yeah. it is like more just to get what he wants rather than like yeah yeah like he doesn't even see other people as people he just sees them as obstacles or mm-hmm. tools in order to get the things he wants yeah but in the end he's like not intimidating at all <laughs> yeah he does have a really great line in the movie where like he's talking to the, the international art police guy and the art police guy's like i'm the one who introduced you to art it was supposed to relax you and he's like yeah i know don't you see how relaxed i am <laughs> yeah. oh yeah i love and you i look it's so good yeah, yeah. uh so, so now let's talk about the international art police person yes i went first for the last one so it's your turn um for the main security guard not the main security guard the one who's like behind, like doing the investigation into the bonnets oh the lead detective guy oh why don't you go first because i didn't pick out a guy for him okay um I basically just cast someone who also very high stakes, very proper, but also can be exceptionally silly. Yeah. So Our Flag Means Death, Ghostbusters, SNL. I went with Leslie Jones. Oh, yeah. I love that. I just thought she'd be really fun. It, like, like, yeah, we got to find this guy and take him down. Yeah. No, I'm not going to help you steal art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My first thought is Ted Danson, but I love a uh, female in the role, so I'm... I'm yeah, let's do I'm one thinking. gender swap. Yeah, I know, I know. Jeez. That was, like, the one I had. Because <laughs> everything else, I'm just like, I don't know if it works. Like, you could... No, let's just go with it as it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, there's fun people to cast for it yeah. already that I think it would be... It's it's good. So then who did you have for the, the chief guard? Um, the chief guard, I actually had this guy from Fargo... Um, his name's Oliver Platt, and he played this store owner. Oh, I know who Oliver Platt is. Okay, yeah, it's not, he, sometimes, I wouldn't say he necessarily gets silly, but he is so over the top of a character mm-hmm. that it just is, like, almost melodramatic or, like, silly. Yeah. Um, and, like, the guy gets in, like, such a huff, you know, the main security guard is so stressed and, like, and very serious that, that I thought, I just kind of pictured, pictured him. Or... I was also thinking he looks very similar, but the main, I think he's French, the main guy in Chocolat, the, like, priest guy who ends up, like, eating all the chocolate. I haven't seen it. Ugh. Um, let me see if I can look up his name. Alfred Molina. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Alfred Molina's so good. Yeah. That's who I was thinking of, yeah. I mean, both of those are so excellent. Yeah. Like, so I've, obviously, the first time I saw Alfred Molina was in Spider-Man, and the first time I saw Oliver Platt was in some sort of comedy. They're both 
exceptionally good actors. Yeah. And they're very, like, similar types. I yeah, think. yeah, they are. Yeah. I, um, let me tell you about mine. Okay. So, uh, we have three people in a row who I didn't intentionally pick them all from Our Flag Means Death. <laughs> but they're all from our flag means death. Yeah. So this one, he was also in Mozart in the Jungle, and I think I first saw him in the that movie called It's Kind of a Funny Story, which didn't do very well, but I saw it and I thought it was sweet. He's an actor named uh, Matthew Maher. Maher. Have you seen Our Flag Means Death? No. He plays Black Pete. He's a white guy with a lisp who plays Black Pete. And he's just very funny. He, he plays high stakes, but is low stakes. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And he he carries himself very, like, I'm the most important person here, but isn't. Mm-hmm. So it's the low stakes person who believes them to be big. And so I thought that that would be very funny, but I think Oliver Platt might be better. Yeah. Like, of everybody here, I would potentially go with Oliver Platt, just so we can have him continually, <laughs> like, having to run around the entire uh, Getty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm down. He seems very like he would be, yeah, the yeah. in charge, but like, very in charge and just slowly getting unraveled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. As opposed to Ma- Matthew Maher, who I think think would kind of start at unraveled mm. and pretending to be raveled. Yeah, yeah, interesting. But isn't. Yeah. So I think you said you didn't have someone for Mustache Guard. Oh yeah, I did. Oh, you did. I to do a callback for um, Buster. I like for you know uh, physical comedy. I went with Tony Hale. That makes total sense. Yeah. I went with a larger gentleman who is known for saying one or less words. <laughs> I went with an actor named Christian Nairn. Okay. Who, well, have you seen Game of Thrones? Yeah. Hodor. Oh, yeah. So he's also in Our Flag Means Death, and he's also just like a DJ. Oh my and gosh. It's just, he's legitimately the coolest dude. <laughs> But he's also, like, a big dude, and he yeah, can kind of, yeah. like, play around with the, the physicality of just being, being, like, I guess. Yeah. And just running around, having things hidden all over the museum that just, like, it's like, well, I'm here, so yoink. I like that. I think that that plays into, like, the, like, reluctant, like, employee. Like, Tony Hale would be more probably, like... Uh, Frenetic? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he, while he can do the physical humor, I don't know that it's necessarily he, the right fit. Do you think of Tony Hale and you think of filling the space with words? Yeah, yeah. And you think of Christian Nairn and you don't think that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's what I thought would be fun. Cool. Did you have any other cast for this that I missed? Um, I kind of thought about the South American man. The, oh, like, cousin. Yes. Great. The I, cousin, not cousin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The quote unquote cousin. I went in two totally different directions. The two that I wrote down were, and it's just so funny how, I mean, obviously casting just sets the tone, but I went with, I had Jack Black and I had uh, Kierkegaard Culkin. (laughs) I want to go with Kierkegaard Culkin. Yeah, because it's just so like. Neither of those people are South American. No, I know, I know. So you would have to do something else. Yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be a South American. Yeah, no, you you don't have to have someone playing some sort of stereotype of a South American guy. Yeah, yeah. It would just be like the, you know, another like slimy quote-unquote cousin that um well because the whole premise of that guy is he's there because like davis leland he's fallen in love with another one of charles bonnet's pieces of art and he keeps showing up to both see it and to try to figure out a way to buy it right making offers and things and it's like yeah i'm here to just see this thing i really like but also i want to buy this yeah And, and yeah it's just kind of like used for comedic purposes and like he has two scenes in the movie but the, he's memorable. Definitely. Well, it's the final button, too. Yeah, you know? very much. Yeah. And, I mean, both of them seem just like that hilarious, like... Let's go with Kieran Culkin, though, because okay, I think yeah. that's very clever. And I think it's funny, kind of lo- is similar to um, Jason Schwartzman in a way, that they're, like, two of, like, these, like... Oh, yeah, 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 a little bit. Yeah. Just, like, they just show up and you just put them face to face, and it's like, huh. And they just walk <laughs> past each other. <laughs> it's like putting uh, the guy who played Will and Will and Grace and Rob Lowe in the same room. Oh, yeah. For the longest time, I thought they were the same person. Definitely. Whoa. Yeah. Excellent. It's the whole uh, Katy Perry, Zoe Deschanel thing? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Then that brings us to writer and director. I have separate writer, separate director. Um, Okay. I, um, the one that I thought of, um, just that came first to my brain um, was Taika Waititi. Yeah, I mean that. I mean he's yeah. gonna come first to everybody, right? Brain. Right, because he just have done has done like you know the Thors now, and 
his other the Thors. The Thors. But you know, so it's like kind of adventure kind of yeah. stuff, but still with a little bit of wit to it. And Taika Waititi and is like the director right now, right, and like he's right. going to be so good course, at yeah, just about every, mind, everything. Yeah. Um, and he's a hyphen it, so he can both write it and direct it. Mm-hmm. I so because our main character is Nicole Bonet, I wanted the writer to be a woman. It should yes. Um, so I went with the woman who wrote is one of the writers on The Lost City on Isn't It Romantic, and oh. most importantly, Cruella. Oh, yeah, because it's cool. a high fashion heist. Yeah, that's so true. And so it's this is a different version of a high fashion heist. Mm-hmm. And so that's Dana Fox. Okay, yeah, I'm not familiar with with that, but like that sounds very appropriate. Um, so I definitely want to go with Dana Fox for a writer, and yeah. then I'm not in love with my director, but I wanted to mention because he's been directing things for a really long time. Like he directed Pleasantville. Mm-hmm. Um, he also directed the first Hunger Games. And the reason I went with this guy was because he was also the director on Ocean's 8. Oh, yeah. Which that makes sense. I liked. <laughs> um, but it's a high stakes heist at the Met Gala. So it's a it's heist like spot in a on. museum. Right, right. Um, and so this director's name is Gary Ross. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Well, I was thinking, doesn't Rashida Jones direct? She does. So maybe she would actually be the perfect director. That would be fun. I'm going to double check that she directs. I know yeah. that she writes. Yeah. I know that she writes because I remember when I was on her IMDb page for this, I was like, she wrote the fourth uh, Toy Story movie? All right. Oh, whoa. Because I was going to say her for writer, but I was like, I don't know. I kind of feel like now that you said that, it should maybe be a female writer. Yeah. She director. directed some episodes of Angie Tribeca, which makes sense because mm-hmm. she was on it. She directed some episodes of Black, uh, Black AF, which makes sense because she was on it. She directed an episode of Roar. She was not on that. And she's directing uh, this movie from... She directed this movie from 2018, which is a documentary called Quincy. I feel like she was a little bit more connected to, but I don't specifically remember. Um, oh, yeah. A, an intimate look into the life of Quincy Jones. Go figure. <laughs> yeah. It's a documentary about her dad. Right. <laughs> oh, no wonder she directed that. Mm-hmm. I think we could have Rashida Jones as our director. I think that would be fun. Yeah. Why not? I mean, she's directed before. Let this be her feature debut. Yeah. I think it's definitely I immediately would be fun. misspelled. <laughs> and then we're going to keep calling it How to Steal a Million and then we'll get to the end of like how long how uh how how long can we live on a million dollars? Um <laughs> couple years? <laughs> not even probably. Yeah. Uh but cool. Here's what we have for How to Steal a Million. Woo! Nicole Bonet will be played by Selena Gomez. Simon Dermott will be Dev Patel. Charles Bonet will be John Leguizamo. Davis Leland will be Jason Schwartzman. The International Art Police will be Leslie Jones. The Chief Guard will be Oliver Platt. Mustache Guard will be Christian Nairn. The South American Man, the uh, cousin, will be Karen Culkin. All of this will be written by Dana Fox and then directed by Rashida Jones. That is How to Steal a Million. Oh my god. We did it. I would see that. Yeah, right? <laughs> that sounds so good. I was just thinking, who directed um, Ghostbusters, the new one with all the women? Oh, uh, the guy whose name I forget. Oh, it was a guy? Yeah. Melissa McCarthy would have been a good mustache man, too. She also, Yeah, she would have yeah. been a very good mustache man. Yeah. I also think of Melissa McCarthy, though, as being a, a verbal. Definitely. But she's, I mean, you think of that primarily, but like... Her... The, the new Ghostbusters or the Lady Ghostbusters? The Lady Ghostbusters. Okay, I looked up the wrong Ghostbusters. Oh, okay. Her, like, reactions, though, like, her physical humor is really funny. Paul and... Feig. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But yeah, she's... She would be good. I mean, Melissa McCarthy is a master comedian. Yeah, like, right, right, you, right. You, you tell her the kind of comedy you want her to do, and she'll do it. She's so good. Yeah. Like, one of the things I kept looking at was Spy, uh, in terms of, like, director for this, but mm. I'm pretty sure that's also Paul Feig. Or no, that's, um... I did think of Paul Feig. I didn't know his name, but I was like... Didn't he do that one... Who did the one about the zombies? Yeah, Paul yeah, Feig. Yeah, yeah, Paul yeah. Feig also directed Spy. So oh, Paul okay, Feig yeah. did Spy and mm. uh, Lady Ghostbusters. So theoretically, he would be very good at this as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know if those two movies have the tone that we went with. Right. Because I think we're still thinking more suave and debonair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these are more slapstick comedies. Yeah, and that is Melissa McCarthy too, a little. And like, yeah. That, Which that is works just for the that character. Then. Right, right, right. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. But no, cool. I think Rashida is, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it, we, we nailed it. Yeah, I, I'm a fan. I, I think you were right to bring her back. I think that was very clever. Yeah. 
Um, cool. So we did it. We remade How to Steal a Million. Corsica, thank you so much for being a guest on my show. Tell people where they can find more stuff about you. Yay! Well, thank you for having me. I would love thinking about this movie and talking about it. I guess my Instagram, I'm not really on it that much, but you can still find me <laughs> there. <laughs> I'm really bad at social media. Um, it's Corsica Jean, J-E-A-N-N-E. And uh, a film I just produced, a short film, is out at a couple of festivals right now. If you're in L.A., hit up Outfest or Michaud. Or if you're in Montreal, um, Fantasia. Um, it's called Keep Delete. Keep Delete? Mm-hmm. It's a sci-fi love story. It's kind of like Eternal Sunshine. Aw. Yeah, erasing memories of relationships. I I wonder what would inspire that. <laughs> I know, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. That's the sort of thing where, like, you make a movie like that, regardless of how you got the idea, and you're just gonna and you're just gonna get the same question every yep. single time. Yep. And I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Great. If you're interested in following me, I am on Twitter at Sam Gash S A M G A S C H, or you can follow the podcast at Ideal Remake on Twitter or Instagram. But, eh, whatever. Join us on Facebook, um, Ideal Remake or Ideal Remake Podcast, or in the show notes, you can join the Dueling Genre Discord and. Let Corsica and I know if we got anything wrong. That's the best way to do that. Or something I haven't asked for in a while. And it's been a year since we've got our last review of Ideal Remake. So hey, maybe spend some time this afternoon, dear listener, going online and going online to Apple Podcasts and leaving all of your favorite podcasts a five-star review. It's amazingly helpful. That's how the algorithm promotes shows. And it'd be really, really great. The other thing I try to do as a member of the Dueling Genre podcast is talk about a different show on the network. And this episode, I'm going to be talking about Toy Story Minute. That's hosted by Robin Garcia and Jebediah Cat. And when they're making the show, there's multiple episodes per week. And basically, they're going through the Toy Story franchise one minute at a time, which is super appropriate because Rashida Jones. Uh, so yeah, check that out. And then... Corsica, thank you so much for being my guest for this episode. So we will end this episode the same way we end every episode by asking you, what is your favorite quote from the movie, How to Steal a Million? I know, I know like the quote, but I don't know exactly how she said it. The what? I love her delivery. It's so predictable in a way, in like the best way. Like um, my favorite Audrey Hepburn movie is Two for the Road. Mm Mm-hmm. And I just, like, will, I'll watch it and I can quote it and I'll, like, talk with her because she just, like, it's, like, musical the way she talks and, like, yeah. her, like, her accent, too. So, and it's, like, and it's, like, where, where do I take you? And he's, like, the Ritz. And she's, like, the what? And it's, like, <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay, I'll, I'll do this one. When they get locked in the closet. Okay. And they're, like, all squished up and he, Simon's, like, comfy. And she goes... I hadn't counted on there being quite so much togetherness. Yeah. I love that. And that... Then there's the one, too, when after they kiss, that's the one I was trying to find. And she's like, suddenly it feels much more spacious in here. There's yeah. something like that. It's I forget good... what the exact well, it's a great is. pairing of, yeah. of quotes. Yeah. And then the sexual one I thought was so funny when he was like, okay, take your clothes off. And she goes, I don't think we're planning the same crime <laughs> yeah that one was also really what, or what kind of crime are we, what kind of crime are we planning here yeah. whatever the quote is that one is also yeah, really yeah, yeah. really good yeah that one's like on repeat on here where is it like i don't know if there's like exactly memorable quotes for this but like all the lines yeah. are said in a way that would be described today to be iconic definitely right yeah they're all very like it's not really lines it's more like uh set up and punch lines it's yeah. like bits like he'll say something and her like the banter of is yeah like, it's, it's so just good. very classic well scripted banter yeah and it's wonderful it is wonderful awesome <laughs> sorry <laughs> no it's good i like it <laughs> okay if you have another one i'll oh yeah it's um yeah the are we plan- are we planning the same sort of crime when he's like take take off your clothes and she's like are we planning the same sort of crime? well it's interesting that it's take off your clothes when she tries it on and then when she puts it on in the museum he's like no no over your clothes and it's like you had me do two different yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right awesome cool <laughs>